Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today we have Michael Margolis presenting Making Arduino Controlled Robots. Michael is the author of the brand new Make Book, Make an Arduino Controlled Robot, and the author of the best-selling Arduino Cookbook, now in its second edition. We are thrilled to have Michael with us today to present this webcast for you all. I do want to let you all know that along the way here, we do have some special discounts for you because you're going to be seeing a lot of cool things, some robots, great information, books. So please be aware of that, and I will push out information to you in your group chat. I will turn the program over to Michael in just a moment, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping things to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Michael. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Michael, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure he sees it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you may need to give it permission to access your account. It will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And our hashtag today is Arduino. If you have any problems during the event, please take a look at the help widget. If you continue to have problems, please post it in the chat room and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast and we'll have an archive ready, usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Michael for his presentation. Hello, Michael. Hello, and hello, everybody. I'm Michael Margulis, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today about making Arduino-controlled robots. This talk is based on my experience of building robots over the last year and a half or so. Uh, a project which I uh, started in order to uh, find a, a way which uh, would enable me to demonstrate as many techniques as possible from the Arduino cookbook. I was looking for a project that would be fun to build but also fun to demonstrate, which used a lot of different Arduino techniques. And uh, Robot is the uh, perfect example of a, uh, a project which draws on many different capabilities. And what I'm going to do today is to share with you uh, some of the uh, the things that I learned and used while building my robot and making the robot perform uh, various tasks. There is a book which has just been released called Make an Arduino Controlled Robot, which, uh, from which this material is, is based, and the, the book covers a great deal more detail than I will have time to cover today. Um, and uh, I will be uh, uh, taking uh, some of the techniques and uh, giving you an idea of, of what you, can, uh, what you can do with the robot. And there's also a kit of the robots that I've made. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about what these robots are. But um, uh, the kits include all of the components and the book necessary to make the robots. To um, take advantage of this talk, you don't need to have this particular kit. Uh, the techniques that I'll be talking about can be applied to any uh, wheeled robot. But if um, uh, scrounging for parts and figuring out how to put them together is less important to you than actually making the robot and having it do something, that there is a kit available. And we'll be talking more about that uh, later on in the talk. What we are going to cover is choosing a robot. And I'll take you through a quick building tour of what's involved in building a robot. We'll look at uh, how robots uh, move and what controls them an introduction to the common sensors that are used with uh, robots, particularly Arduino robots. And uh, I'll look at a number of uh, tasks that are common uh, with robots and the code that makes them happen. And then at the end, uh, we'll have time for some questions and answers. 
the tasks that I'm going to be covering are uh, uh, popular tasks that people uh, often uh, enjoy working with and uh, sometimes have contests uh, for. And they include uh, edge detection, where the robot moves until it detects the end of its uh, allowable world and uh, moves to stay within it. Line following, where the robot follows a, uh, a line. Obstacle avoidance, where the robot uses a sensor to detect where obstacles are and moves around to avoid them. And then the final task that we'll be talking about is how to remote control the robot. But first, let's um, do a poll to see what your experience levels are and um, how much uh, knowledge and, and experience you have with, with robots so that I can focus my talk to address your needs. So uh, here is a poll which uh, has some questions, and you can answer as many or all of those questions that are relevant to give me an indication of what your experience level is and how much uh, both with Arduino and with robots. And I'll, uh, I'll read through them. If you are new to Arduino, if you're interested in robots but you haven't any experience with Arduino, then tick that button. Um, if you uh, want to build and program an Arduino robot, tick that button. And if you don't tick that button, then I'll be asking you later why you joined this call. Uh, if you've uh, not decided about robots but you're interested in understanding what's involved and, and what they can do, then please tick that button. And if you already have done some work with robots, Arduino or not, uh, but uh, want to learn a little bit more, then uh, please tick. So as, well, you can see this yourself, um, half of you are new to Arduino, so I will be explaining a little bit about um, some of the Arduino concepts for those that are new. Um, it's good to see that uh, uh, more than half of you do want to uh, build and program a robot. Uh, some of you are undecided, and only a small majority have a robot. So I will be focusing the talk on people that are relatively new to, uh, to robots. And let's press on. There are lots of different types of robots. Uh, there are robots with uh, two legs, the RoboSapien robot that you can uh, see in the bottom left of your screen. There are robots with more than two legs. There's a, the uh, blue robot in the center is a six-legged robot, a hexapod. Uh, there are robots with no legs at all, the robotic snake, which you can see at the right. But far and away, the most popular robot is, um, particularly with Arduino, is a, uh, are wheeled robots. And uh, there are two major types, uh, two-wheeled and four-wheeled robots. And we'll be looking at both of those in this talk. A uh, two-wheel robot is uh, light and maneuverable, and it's particularly good for doing some of the tasks where agility is important, where the robot needs to turn uh, in, in relatively short paces, uh, uh, short spaces, and move around quickly. Uh, the robot balances on a caster, which you can't see in, in this picture, but it's in the front of the robot. And um, this caster requires a relatively smooth surface. It does not work well outdoors. If you want a robot that's capable of running outdoors, then the four-wheel robot is the better choice. Uh, it's great for rough surfaces. Uh, the particular robot that I built and the robot that's in the kit has a platform uh, so it can carry things. But the four-wheeled robots are less dexterous than the two-wheeled robots, so uh, choose accordingly. So let's have a look at the elements that make up a robot. Um, we'll first look at the, uh, uh, all of the components. The robot consists of the mobility platform, the chassis and wheels and, and motor, which, which moves the, the robot. Uh, because we're building Arduino robots, there's a, an Arduino board. Uh, but the Arduino board isn't capable of directly driving the motor, so it needs another board. Um, those of you that aren't familiar with Arduino may um, um, not be aware, but there are plug-in boards, which in Arduino speak are called shields, which uh, plug directly into the Arduino board, which have the capability of driving the motor and also or the motors and also other capabilities, which we'll be looking at later on. Um, the robot also requires sensors in order to be aware of its environment. We'll be looking at a number of those sensors later on.
The uh, chassis construction really depends on the robot that you have. The kit that, uh, uh, that I designed is, uh, there is a two-wheel and a four-wheel version. This is the, the two-wheel version. Basically, it consists of a, of a chassis which is capable of holding uh, the motors. The motors themselves typically have uh, gear drives in them uh, to give them, uh, the, uh, run the robot up the correct speed and also to uh, uh, improve the torque of the, uh, of the robot. And building the, the chassis is relatively straightforward if it's clear where all the parts go. So I'm going to quickly take you through uh, some of the diagrams that I've included in the book that show the uh, elements of, uh, of assembly, just to give you an idea of the uh, stages of uh, building the robot. Uh, now, I'm not seeing changes on my console. So Yasmina, are you seeing them change on your side? Slides are changing, yes. Okay, great. Um, there's a, uh, some uh, soldering involved with the, with the motors. Uh, uh, those of you who have uh, uh, built uh, motorized projects with Arduino may be aware that uh, motors generate uh, interference. And so uh, soldering a capacitor uh, across the motor is uh, the, uh, the proper way of uh, reducing the interference, which can affect the Arduino, and there's examples of, uh, of that. So a sh the chassis gets built, which then leads you to the electronics. The electronics consists of two elements. There's obviously the Arduino board, which um, is usually fully built, although you can get Arduino kits. Uh, this, the particular robots that I designed use a standard Arduino board. There are um, a, a couple of standard Arduino boards. I, I've chosen the very latest board, the Leonardo, uh, because it has a little bit more ca uh, extra capabilities than the previous board, the Uno. But um, um, almost any Arduino board would be capable of, uh, of performing all of the tasks that we're going to be talking about. Uh, as I mentioned, the Arduino board itself it doesn't have enough power to actually drive the motors directly, so an, another board called the, the shield, the motor shield, is required. The one I chose is the uh, Adafruit motor shield. Um, there are a vast range of, of different motor shields. I chose this one for a number of reasons. One is that this particular shield can drive four motors, which if you are building a four-wheeled robot or robot which has four motors, and uh, this is an excellent choice. Most of the other popular shields only drive two. But another reason I chose it is because there is a little prototyping area which enables sensors to directly plug in, which makes it just very easy to run experiments and change experiments. And we'll be looking at that a bit later on as well. And um, another reason I chose it is because there are excellent step-by-step -step build instructions for how to put it together. This uh, particular shield does require soldering. Not every shield does, but this one does. But uh, it's a very easy uh, build. So here you see the built shield. And on the bottom right is this uh, the sockets, which is a prototyping area to plug in the, the sensors. And we'll be looking at some of the sensors that plug into there later on. Uh, the sensors themselves need to be connected up, and uh, there are lots of different ways of doing it. One of the easiest when you have uh, a bunch of sensors is to use a strip board such as this and then uh, wire the strip board together and connect it up. Uh, if uh, you're at the stage of building a robot where you need to do this, I realize that these slides are moving too fast for you to, uh, uh, to do that, but uh, uh, you can look at the uh, at the, the video of the presentation uh, later on, or of course, uh, I would be very pleased if you bought the book, which contains these and many, many more illustrations of how to connect up uh, the electronics. So here is a picture of uh, the robot with the chassis built and the Arduino, which, you, it, which is underneath the board that you're actually looking at, which is the motor shield. The, uh, the motor shield is actually plugged directly into the Arduino, uh, ready for sensors to be connected. And uh, here is a picture of the uh, two sensors. Those are the um, little red uh, uh, boards on the uh, front of the robot. These sensors are used to uh, for edge detection. We'll talk about edge detection later on. And here is a picture showing the robot with a the strip board with three sensors, which are is used to determine 
uh, where the line is for line following. And again, we'll be looking at line following later on as well. So here is the, uh, the final uh, view of the, the built robot. It has uh, a sensor at the top, the eyes, the face that you see is the uh, ultrasonic sensor for detecting the uh, distance from objects, and it's used for obstacle avoidance. And I'll be talking about how that works and, and the code necessary to make that and all the other sensors work uh, shortly. But first, let's look at what is involved in uh, moving the robot. Uh, the robots move by controlling the relative speeds and directions of the wheels. Um, so driving both wheels forward uh, causes the robot to move forward and reversing the direction of the wheels reverses the direction of the robot. Uh, turning is done by changing the relative speeds of the wheels. So for example, for our right hand turn, the right wheel would turn more slowly than the left wheel. Or to rotate the robot in place, you would have the, uh, uh, in this case, uh, or to rotate right uh, clockwise, the right wheel would be rotating uh, backwards and the left wheel would be rotating forwards and that, that would cause the, rotate, the robot to rotate uh, clockwise. The actual control of the motors, uh, the control of the speed and the direction is done by the motor shield. And the name of the circuit which does that motor control is called an H-bridge. Uh, the H-bridge consists of uh, switches, they're electronic switches. Uh, they're semiconductors which control the polarity of the motor. And it's called an H-bridge because of the characteristic shape of the connections of the, of the motor. And the way an H-bridge works is by switching the, uh, the, the motor to connect up the supply voltage and ground according to the direction that you want the motor to turn. So in this example, we want the motor to turn forward. Uh, we close switch A and switch D. Uh, switch A connects the positive supply voltage to the positive side of the motor. Uh, switch D, the negative side of the motor to ground. And uh, that will cause the motor to rotate in one direction. Uh, the uh, Arduino pins control which direction it is, and there are functions available in, um, uh, in fact, uh, that are, uh, in the book and in the kit, which for people attending on this call, all of the code that I'm going to be talking about is available for a free download, and we'll be providing a link to that code uh, later on. Uh, the code needs to be modified depending on the motor shield you use. I've provided um, a code for a number of popular motor shields, but in principle, they all work like this, a function to uh, cause the motor to move forward, uh, calls the Arduino function digital write, which those not familiar with Arduino uh, uh, may want to know that uh, uh, that function sets the pin, which in this case is the direction pin, to a particular value. To reverse the motor, um, the switches are, are set to connect it up the opposite way. So switch B and C are closed. Switch C connects the positive supply voltage to the negative side of the motor. And uh, switch B connects the positive side of the motor to ground. And because these are DC motors, the motor will rotate in the opposite direction. And a pin is set to change that, and a, f a function is used to call the, uh, the pin. Uh, there are a couple of ways of stopping a motor. One is that uh, some uh, shields, some uh, H bridges have the ability to open up all the switches, uh, but there is another way of, uh, of doing it, which is to control the amount of power that's actually fed through the supply voltage. And controlling the power to the supply voltage controls the speed of the motor. So let's look at how that works. The way these DC motors are controlled is using a technique called pulse width modulation, or PWM. Pulse width modulation is about uh, controlling the width of a pulse so that when the uh, pulse is relatively narrow, relatively short, relatively small amount of current goes through the motor. And when the pulse is longer, more current goes through the motor. That's perhaps best illustrated through um, uh, this diagram. 
So if you don't want the motor to run, you set the pulse so it is never on. And the way you do that in Arduino is you use the function called analog write. And analog write uh, you, uh, is given a pin, the pin that you want to control, and the value that you want to set the pulse width to, in, in, in this case, zero. Technically, that's called a 0% duty cycle. There is no pulse. Um, in the, uh, the next example, uh, if you want the motor to be given 25% of the current, you'd use an analog write to the pin, but you'd uh, give it a value which is 25% of the the maximum value. Now, the Arduino uh, PWM pin is an 8-bit register, and uh, if that doesn't mean anything, suffice it to say that 8 bits represent a maximum value of 255. So the highest value that you can write to this pin is 255, and um, the lowest value is zero. So 25% of 255 is more or less 63. That will generate the pulse that you see, 25% 20, uh, of the time, the motor has a pulse. If we analog write 127, which is a half of 255, then we have a pulse that's half on and half off. And if we write 255, then uh, the motor is given its full power. So that is the principle upon which the robot speed is controlled. And let's actually now have a look at a um, uh, a task where we're controlling both the uh, speed and direction of the robot, but also using a sensor to determine where it is. And this task is called edge detection. Um, and the way it works is that there are sensors on the front of the robot. You can probably just make them out as these little red uh, pieces. We'll look at a, have a closer look at it a bit later on. And these sensors are facing down, and they're, they're looking at the reflection from the surface that the robot is moving. And when the robot's over a white surface, there's a lot of reflection, and the robot is instructed to move forward whilst this happens. But, and I'll start the simulation, um, when the robot uh, sensor is over a dark area, the robot stops, turns, uh, in order to stay within its designated area. So let's just have a look at what's actually happening. So coming up on the screen is our four panels, which are, are showing how edge detection is uh, affecting the movement of the robot. Uh, the robot in panel one is over the reflective area, or at least the sensors are over the reflective area. The robot moves forward. When a sensor is not over a reflective area, the robot stops, it rotates uh, in panel two. In panel three, the robot has rotated. It will then, because its sensors are now over the reflective area, move forward. And it will keep doing that until the batteries run out. So here are the reflective sensors, which consists of an infrared emitter, a, a device which uh, sends a, a small beam of infrared light, and an infrared detector, which can detect uh, infrared, which it will if the uh, emitted beam is reflected off a surface. And here is the code for doing edge detection. So this is Arduino code. Now, uh, those of you that are new to Arduino, um, if you're not new to programming, you may be able to follow some of this. But even if you can't um, uh, follow the details of the code, I hope that the explanation that I'm about to give will uh, show how easy it is to, um, to implement, how few lines of code you need to implement uh, the, the behavior of, uh, of edge detection. Um, every Arduino, uh, what's called a sketch, every Arduino program has a function called loop, and when the program uh, is running, it's calling loop. It, it keeps repeating all of the functions here. And the first thing it does is call a function called look for obstacle. We'll be looking uh, briefly at, at this uh, uh, shortly. Um, and look for obstacle is given the obstacle you want to look for, and it will return back whether it's found that obstacle. In this case, uh, we're looking for the left edge, and if it's found the left edge, that is the sensor is no longer over the reflective surface, then it will print a statement saying it's detected the left edge. 
Uh, time move back 100 means move the robot back away from the edge. 100 is uh, 100 uh, milliseconds, a tenth of a second. And then rotate the robot 30. Uh, positive rotations are clockwise and negative rotations are counterclockwise. Obviously, you're welcome to uh, uh, have your own code. You don't have to emulate these, these functions, but you'd be more than welcome to use this as an example of uh, how, to, uh, uh, how to implement these capabilities. So if look for obstacle um, uh, doesn't find a, uh, an obstacle on the left edge, it will then look for one on the right edge. And it, if found, it will print that it's found one on the right edge. It will then move back and this time rotate counterclockwise. If it hasn't found an obstacle on the left or the right, it will set the speed to whatever speed you want. In this case, uh, I've set it to the minimum speed and move forward. And the robot keeps repeating that. That is, it will move forward unless it has uh, found an obstacle. And if it does find an obstacle, it will turn. That's the code for, for doing that. If we now look at the code to actually do the edge detection, uh, it's also actually relatively simple. It may not appear that if you're new to Arduino, but uh, uh, if, um, if you do uh, start up with, with Arduino, I don't think you would have, uh, it would be too difficult to, uh, to get to grips with this. It's a function called IR Edge Detect, which is given the sensor that you want to detect, and this will return true if it does detect an edge. And what this function does is it calls analog read on the particular sensor. Analog read is the Arduino function to read an analog value, and it will return the value back. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the sensors will return back a, uh, a low value if there is a reflection and a high value if there isn't. And that may seem unintuitive, but that's the way the sensors are made. It has nothing to do with, uh, with Arduino. The sensors work that way. It happens to be a characteristic of the way the transistors in the, uh, the sensors actually function. Um, but if you bear in mind that it does appear a little bit inverted, uh, low value means reflection, high value means uh, uh, obstacle, then uh, the rest of the code I think will make sense. The uh, variable called value is set to whatever the reading is, and this value is compared to a threshold, which is stored in the IR sensor uh, array. And if it's uh, greater than or equal to that threshold, then it returns true that it has detected the edge. Uh, so that's IR edge detection. Well, where does that threshold come from? Well, the thresholds are sent at, in a calibration function when the robot starts. And it's important to calibrate the infrared sensors because uh, the sensors are not only affected by the infrared emitter that we uh, spoke about earlier, it's also affected by ambient light. Sunlight or uh, incandescent light uh, also will reflect off the, the surface and can affect the sensor. So the robot needs to measure the amount of ambient infrared light in order for it to correctly determine when the level is being changed by the, uh, the actual infrared sensor itself, the infrared uh, emitter. Uh, so the IR uh, sensor calibrate is what does that. And um, the way that works is when the robot starts up it, uh, on a reflective surface, it calls analog read for the particular sensor, stores the value in ambient, and then it calculates a value which is, uh, in this case, um, twice the ambient level is the, is the threshold. Um, that is, when the reflection is half, then the robot assumes that it has uh, reached the edge. So that is the code for, uh, for edge detection. We're now going to look at something that's a little bit more complicated, but um, I find a lot more interesting, which is line following. In line following, the robot orients itself so it stays positioned above a line. And the way that works is um, you can see in these four panels. So the robot placed over the line will move forward. And at some point in moving, either because it's not going absolutely straight or more likely because it's reached a point where the line has curved, the sensors will uh, detect the difference between the reflections and the robot will move. Well, here's how that works. Here we have a, a picture uh, showing the robot over uh, the line.
line. So there's a black line on a white surface, and there are three sensors which are more clearly visible on the right-hand side. And I think you can see that the center sensor is over the reflective surface, and the two edge sensors, the sensors on the left and the right, are over the reflective surface. The chart at the bottom shows the relative levels that will be read from the analog read function, the level that uh, when the Arduino reads the sensors, it will see. So the center sensor, because it's not reflective, has a high value. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, that's the way the sensor works. When the, there's not a reflection, the value is high. And the left and right sensors, because they're reflected, have a low value. The relative difference between the left and the right sensors is used to calculate drift. It's used to calculate the uh, offset of the robot from the, uh, the center um, of the line. And we'll look at how that's calculated in the next slide. So here, hopefully we see, it's not coming up on mine. Yasmina, can you see line following with the robot to the right? I can see it. Okay. Okay, so on this slide, hopefully you're seeing um, the robot has, um, has moved forward, and now the line is veering off to the right. In a sense, the robot is uh, to the left of the line. So the center sensor and the right-hand sensor are now over the non-reflective line. Uh, the left sensor is still reflecting. And if you look at the, the bar chart, uh, you, can see that, um, uh, you can see that on the bar chart. So the, um, the center sensor has decreased in value. The right sensor has increased in value. The left sensor hasn't changed uh, from, uh, from before. And because there is uh, less reflection on the right-hand side, the drift value increases. Um, we've now moved, I think, to the, uh, I think you're now seeing the, the slide. Okay. So, we're, we're, I think we're back to the slide where the robot is, um, uh, has the center and right sensor over the line. And I will now try to advance, and hopefully you will see shortly that uh, here is the case where the robot has moved and the uh, center and left-hand sensor is um, over the line. And the readings uh, from Arduino show that the left sensor now increases in value because it's getting uh, reduced reflection. The center is getting reduced, uh, well, increased reflection from when it was centered over the line, so its value is decreased. Um, and now the drift value is negative. It's, it's pointing to the left, uh, indicating that uh, the robot is um, um, uh, off to the, uh, to the left. So uh, these values can be used to uh, adjust the speed of the, of the motors, and here is the code to make, that, uh, to make that happen. The loop code, the main Arduino code to do line following is as simple as two lines. The first line calls a function called line sense, which calculates the drift, and the second function called line follow takes the drift and the desired speed and controls the motor. So let's look at how, um, let's look at those two functions. So line sense is a function which returns the drift, and it will return zero when the center is over the line. It will return a negative value if it's to the left and a positive value to the right. And this function is actually quite simple. There are three calls to analog read. There are three, um, uh, uh, three calls to read the three sensors. Analog read will return the value from each of the sensors, left, center, and right. And the remainder of the code simply calculates the difference between the left and the right values and returns that as drift. And that information is then fed into the line follow function, which takes the drift and the desired speed and calculates the motor speed. And the way that works is that um, the left speed is calculated as the desired speed minus the drift divided by damping. Now, damping is a factor which is used to reduce the sensitivity of the robot because the challenge in, in uh, having your robot do this task is that if the robot's too sensitive, it's going to oscillate wildly around the line, uh, trying to move too quickly. 
And if it's not sensitive enough, it's going to uh, miss sharp turns. It's not going to be able to turn fast enough to, uh, to handle and orient itself around a curve that's relatively sharp. So the sensitivity needs to be adjusted for the balance between uh, uh, fast enough for sharp curves and, and slow enough so it's not gyrating wildly. And this value is determined by trial and error. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, using existing code with, with existing uh, hardware is that you get a version that, uh, you get a value that's pre-compiled. Pre but um, uh, you can uh, experiment by different values in order to get the robot correctly following it. Uh, so back to the code, the, um, the write speed is calculated uh, similarly, but with the, the sign differently, so the left speed um, subtracts the drift and the right speed adds, adds the drift uh, divided by the damping. And then these values are directly used to control the motor speed. Um, there's a, there are functions to control the, the motor and um, that function uh, takes the an, an indicator as to which motor you want to control and the speed you want to control it and that will uh, control the motor. As I mentioned, the uh, download code, which is uh, available to people on this call, has library functions for uh, a number of different um, uh, H-bridges, a number of different motor controllers. The next task we're going to look at is obstacle avoidance. And here, what the robot uses an ultrasonic distance sensor to send out a ping of sound and uses a reflection when uh, the, that ping hits an obstacle to determine how far the obstacle is. And in the robots that I built and the robots in the kit, the uh, sensor is mounted on, to, on a servo so the robot can look around and move in a direction where there's no obstacle. So here is an example of uh, the robot using that capability. In panel one, the robot is moving forward. It's pinging, not finding a reflection. In panel two, it's come close to an obstacle. The reflection indicates the distance, and if it's too close, uh, the robot will uh, stop and look around. In panel three, it's looking to the left uh, and pinging, but it still sees the obstacle in, in Panel four, the robot's looking to the right. It's not detecting an obstacle because the pulses, pulses of sound that it's sending out are not being reflected. And so the robot can rotate in that direction and move off. So here is a simulation of the robot actually uh, doing that task. Hits an obstacle, looks around, turns, uh, finds another obstacle, and looks around and turns in a direction where there's no obstacle. If the robot's in a blind alley, that is if, it, if it's blocked left, uh, forward, and right, then the robot will turn 180 degrees and move backwards. So here is uh, some code that will um, implement that. The loop code, uh, again, is very simple. Uh, calls a function move forward, which just drives the motor forward. Um, it calls a function called roam, which does the hard work of looking around. And the roam function um, uses the, uh, the distance sensor and the servo to uh, find out what the distance is at different angles to an object. So the first line of this code calls a function called look at, and it uh, looks at the angle of the servo to look forward. Um, uh, Arduino servos are uh, controlled by giving the angles, and uh, here we are uh, using a constant to say what angle is going to be forward and uh, how much we want to turn left and right. So uh, we calculate the distance forward. We'll, we'll look at the look at function in a second. We check if the distance is less than or equal to the minimum distance. And if it is, we stop. We then call the look at function again. But this time, we ask it to look left and get the distance. And if the left, the left distance is uh, greater than the distance we've defined is clear, then we rotate the robot left. Minus 90 means it's going to rotate um, uh, counterclockwise 90 degrees, we rotate left. Uh, but if the, uh, the left distance isn't clear, then we uh, are in the else function and we uh, call the look at 
in the right direction and we get the distance to the right. And if that distance is greater than clear, then we can rotate the robot uh, right uh, 90 degrees clockwise and move off. And if neither of those are true, if it's not clear to the left and not clear to the right, that's where we do um, the avoidance, which is to move back for a second. Time move back is um, 1,000 1, is 1,000 milliseconds or one second. And we rotate 180 degrees, turn around, and uh, move off. Uh, here, uh, quickly, is the uh, look at function. Uh, this returns the, the distance of an object at a given angle. And um, uh, this uses a function called so soft servo right. The uh, people who in the, in the poll are familiar with Arduino will know that Arduino has functionality for controlling servos. Uh, it's got a library called servo, and it's very effective. You can tell it to move a servo in a particular angle and immediately do something else, and it will use some hardware in the Arduino to be controlling the direction of the servo whilst your Arduino code is doing something else, which in many circumstances is very useful. But in this robotics case, it's not what we want. We need to wait until the servo has actually fully moved in the direction that we want before we can do the next step, which is to measure the distance. If we're measuring the distance while the servo is still turning, then we're not going to get uh, something accurate. Um, but there's another reason why uh, the Arduino servo library isn't used, and that is that the hardware that it uses is uh, a timer. And the Arduino, standard Arduino board has three timers. The Leonardo, which is the board that I've chosen for the, uh, for the kit, has four timers. But these are scarce resource, and the timers are used for lots of other stuff. The timers are used to control the motor speed, um, one timer for each motor. And the timers are also used for other things like remote control, which we'll be talking about shortly. And if we do all the other stuff, there, isn't, there aren't enough timers to run the servo. So because we don't need the uh, core servo functionality, we can write our own servo code. So uh, that's what soft servo write is. And we'll look very quickly at, uh, at what that is in a second. Um, we call soft servo right with the angle that we want it to turn and how long we want it to wait. We then call ping get distance, which is the code which uh, sends the ping, the sound pulse out, and will return us the distance. And um, we then check to see whether the servo was looking straight ahead or whether we turned it. And if we turned it, we move it back to the center so it's correctly oriented for the next, uh, the next call. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with servos, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to have time for me to do a servo tutorial, but suffice it to say that the servo direction is controlled by sending it pulses of different pulse widths. Um, the soft servo code is, for those that are familiar with servos, is code which converts the angle into a, um, into a pulse width. I don't have time on this call to go through uh, the detail here, but if there are uh, a number of people that want to go in details, maybe we can cover it in more detail during the uh, Q&A session. And the ping code, the way the ping code works, uh, this is ping get distance, which you give it the, paint, the pin that the ping, the ultrasonic sensor is connected to, and it returns back the distance. And the way these sensors work is that you um, uh, send it a pulse which determines, which tells it to actually generate the sound wave. And then you read the value on the pin in order to get um, uh, uh, the return, the time it takes for the uh, pin to return, the uh, sound wave to return. And um, uh, to do that, we need to set the mode of the pin to be an output, uh, and then we use the Arduino functions to write pulses. And then we use a, um, we set the mode to an input and we use the Arduino pulse in um, function. If you are not familiar with pulse in, again, we probably won't have time to, to, to cover it, but pulse in is a very, very useful function. And if you're not familiar with it and you're doing robotics code, have a look at the Arduino reference section. It's a standard Arduino function. It's a very, very useful function. 
The last task that we're going to be talking about is remote control. And in the, uh, the robots that I've built, I've uh, used a standard TV type remote control and uh, implemented that by using a, the decoder chip that is usually built into a TV. But in this case, uh, you can see it here plugged uh, directly into that prototyping area that I talked about before. <coughs> All the sensors connect into here. Uh, in this case, I'm uh, showing the, uh, the remote control. And um, the way the, the remote control works is that um, the uh, pulse sequence generated by a button push is used to uh, control a particular movement of the Arduino. So the first thing that needs to happen is we need to teach the Arduino what the particular remote control buttons are. And that's done with a learning remote control code, uh, a sketch that's included in the code download, which um, uh, uses the, uh, the infrared, the decoder, to uh, detect the button presses and uh, stores the values for each of the button presses. So if you run that sketch, what you would see is when you started it up, it would say, ready to learn remote codes, and then prompt you for each of the codes that uh, you want to learn. In this case, press the remote key for forward, and then when it detects the press, it will ask you to release the key, and it will print the key. And it will do that for all of the keys which you, um, uh, you want to learn. Uh, I'm showing about uh, what six or seven different keys, forward, back, left, right, clockwise, counterclockwise, and halt. But you can have as many commands as you have buttons on your remote control. Um, and you can, uh, this information is printed in the serial monitor in the Arduino development environment. And you can cut and paste these values directly into the next um, Arduino sketch, which is actually the runtime sketch, the sketch that uh, is co actually controlling the robot. And what's happening here is that the decoder module is again picking up the key presses and uh, turning it into codes. And then there's a function called convert IR to command, which does a lookup for each of the codes that we previously detected and associates it with the command which you have told it you wanted to execute when it gets that key press. And that would cause the robot to go forwards, backwards, or whatever. Um, the, uh, the, the code for doing that is uh, relatively straightforward. It's using a, um, a switch statement don't have time to go into the programming of switch statements, but again, it's explained in, uh, um, in the Arduino reference and uh, a lot of online uh, material. And um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the things that you can do, the, one of the reasons the code is structured the way it is structured, is that uh, I wanted the, uh, to provide the capability of having the remote control not just come from a TV remote. I wanted it to come from other sources. So for example, uh, it's possible to decode uh, serial commands coming from uh, a serial monitor, for example. Uh, to control the robot for testing. Or more interestingly, um, if you plug in a Bluetooth module uh, and receive the serial commands via Bluetooth, it's possible to control the robot uh, through a phone. There are lots of other capabilities of, that are described in the book and, and um, uh, which you can do with your robots responding to sensors such as passive infrared, which is detecting body heat. So it, the robot can respond to a physical presence of a person or your pet and do something or sound, clap to start or stop the robot. Uh, the book describes how to uh, build a battery low voltage warning by using the Arduino um, analog read capability. There's a battery charger circuit, so you can use rechargeable batteries, and we've talked about uh, Bluetooth. Uh, there's one um, last thing that I want to cover in this part before we go to um, uh, questions and answers, and that is um, a utility which I think you'd find very useful, whether you duplicated the robot that I built or uh, did something completely different. And that is a capability to view real-time information coming out of Arduino. The typical way of tuning and debugging, we talked before about tuning the uh, line following by uh, trying different damping values, uh, is to use serial print statements, which you can do through the serial monitor or you can do. 
through through wireless. But uh, reading the digital data, reading the lines of data moving past, uh, it's very, very difficult to uh, handle the amount of data that comes. So a real-time display makes things easier. Um, and um, I, if you're not familiar with processing, and processing is the environment which is displaying uh, this information on your computer, I suggest you just make a note of this URL, www.processing.org. Uh, processing is a sister environment to Arduino, which actually runs on, a, on your computer. Um, and it, the, there is processing code in the download, which does what I'm about to, uh, to explain. You saw a bit of the output of this when we were talking about line following, because the bar charts which I showed are actually screen grabs from the processing uh, sketch. And the, uh, the processing sketch uh, receives serial information from Arduino, and I'll, I'll show you how to format that in a second, and displays the values both using a, a bar chart and also digitally. Uh, on, in fact, if I bring up these labels. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can label each of, the, uh, each of the bars. You can send data to set the value of the bars. And you can also set the range, uh, because uh, in some cases you want a range that is appropriate to the values that come out of Arduino. Arduino uh, analog uh, read has values from 0 to 1,023. Um, may seem arbitrary to those not familiar with Arduino, but there you go. Um, and you can set the range so that uh, whatever these arbitrary values are, the size of the bar is proportional to the actual uh, dynamic range of the, the thing that you're reading. Uh, I don't know whether you can see on the screen, but um, it, uh, the screen is showing the bars are from top to bottom left, left line, center line, right line. The li line below that is the drift. And the drift value is actually ranging from minus 1,024 to plus 1,024, which is how it's displayed in the center. And then the final uh, value below that is distance, where it's displaying the distance in inches from the, uh, from the ping sensor. So uh, if you're looking for a real-time display of, of Arduino data, uh, you're more than welcome to download the code from the book. We'll give you uh, uh, links to do that, and uh, you can use that. Here is the, um, the functions that you use to, uh, in the Arduino code to control it. There's a function called send data, where you give it the row that you want to uh, you want the data to display it and the value that you want to display. There's a function called send label where you give it the row that you want to label and the string that you that you want to label. And a function called send range where you give it the row and the minimum and the maximum. And those three functions were able to create all of the displays that you that you saw. You can add more rows to it. Um, what you're seeing on the screen now is added information to show the uh, values from the left and right motors, which can be very useful when you're adjusting the, the damping. So that's a very quick run-through on my experience with uh, uh, over the last year and a half with Arduino robots. I hope that you have found it uh, useful. And I will look forward now to seeing what questions that you have, and uh, um, we'll be looking forward to hopefully giving you as, as many of you as, uh, as I can, the, the answers. So let's move on to questions. Uh, oh, in fact, Yasmin, let me bring you in here. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Michael, do, for a do, fascinating do. presentation. We do have several questions that have come in. Folks that have sent in your questions, thank you very much. And we want to encourage those of you who have not opened your group chat, Open it, type your question in for Michael, send it in so he can answer it while he's with us. And at this time, I'd also like to take the opportunity to let you all know, as a thank you for attending today's webcast, Make has a terrific offer discount for you all. Write this down. Special code is ROBOT10. Write that down, ROBOT10. It will save you some money on Michael's books and the two-wheel and four-wheel robots. You don't want to miss those. Makershed.com, and use that code, ROBOT10. Back to you, Michael. Okay, now I, um, well, uh, I am opening my questions window, but my uh, console seems to have uh, frozen. So perhaps, Jasmina, if you can read me the questions until my console responds. Sure. <laughs> uh, and the, 
Let's do it, let's do it. Okay, we do have several questions. We'll take them in the order they came in. Dom May has a question. Is there any way to read all the sensors in parallel? Threading or pseudo-threading? Uh, uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. There, Arduino itself, certainly the standard Arduino, does not provide uh, threading. There are some libraries that provide a degree of pseudo-threading, um, the most popular of which are libraries which are actually doing what's called cooperative multitasking. They are in the background looking at each of the um, uh, each of the values in turn. And the place to find these is on the playground. So the Arduino, the Arduino wiki is called the playground. And that's a good place to look for, uh, do a search for threading, do a third, uh, search for multitasking. Um, that's a place in which you can find it. But I have to say that uh, although I have written some of those multi-threading uh, capabilities uh, for Arduino, I've not found the need to use it for any of these um, uh, library, uh, the, any of these robot capabilities. Um, so although they're there, um, they, th there's an awful lot you, that you can do uh, without them. Okay, our next question. Uh, Yasmina, my, my, my console has unfortunately uh, uh, crashed, <laughs> so I'm going to have to rely on you to... Uh, sure, no uh, problem, no problem. And folks, keep questions coming. We have a question now from Angel. Angel asks, can the distance to the obstacle be approximated using TOA, TDOA, RSSI, or something similar? Uh, yes. There, in fact, um, there's a book called Making Things Talk uh, by Tom Igo, who discusses many of those techniques. Uh, but they're pretty rough. So um, um, whether, if you don't mind your robot actually bumping into things, um, uh, then uh, um, that's uh, that's definitely possible. So yes, it's possible. Uh, I would. It's not as accurate as the sensors that are designed specifically for uh, detecting the physical distance to an object. Uh, we've discussed in this talk uh, just one of those types, which is the ultrasonic sensor, and there are a number of different ultrasonic sensors. There are other technologies as well. Um, uh, a very popular alternative is uh, infrared range finding using the technology that uh, is used in digital cameras uh, to uh, use the uh, parallax in order to uh, detect distance. Uh, so there are a lot of there are a lot of different techniques. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. And one of the great things about robots is that it is um, that none of them are, are perfect, and it can be great fun experimenting. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. A question here from Mr. Puddle: How many different types of remote controls can be sampled? Is it possible to use multiple TV-style remotes at the same time? Ah, now that, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Um, uh, I think it would be tricky, and, and I think it would be tricky on um, uh, a couple of grounds. One is that there are a number of different protocols that uh, TV remote controls use, and those protocols involve uh, completely different, uh, completely different timing. Um, and certainly, the the code that is available, uh, that is included in the download, and is also available if you do a search for TV remote control in Arduino in the playground, you can find that code as well. Um, uh, would struggle if there were two remote controls at the two infrared remote controls um, at the same time. Uh, so, uh, if you want multiple controls, probably um, would I would suggest looking at something other than uh, than infrared. Uh, so, I hope that answers the question. There are some tricks that you could apply if you could select the specific controls to minimize the interference, but uh, generally I think it would be uh, a challenging task. Great, thank you. Several more questions here, and folks, we, our time is starting to wind down, so we're going to take as many as we have time for. Question here from Booty. Booty asks, what are the best reference tutorials on using Android phones to control the robot? Ah. Uh, yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good question. The easiest way I have found, uh, well, actually, before I, I give you my experience, probably the best thing to do, because this is something that's changing um, uh, quite quickly, is to do a search on Arduino and Android. Uh, it's a search that uh, I did 
did a lot of whilst I was building the robots, and I was constantly finding um, um, new stuff. Uh, there are two which I think are worth um, exploring. Uh, one is called uh, Handbag. It's a rather strange name from a very bright guy. Um, it's called Handbag because it accessorizes your Arduino. Um, but um, uh, it is an Android app which can communicate with Arduino. And the other one is, and it's the, actually the one that I uh, uh, played with most, is called Amarino. I think it's A-M-A-R-I-N-O, which is an, um, an Android app and an Arduino library. And, and um, what it does is it sends a, a serial, uh, serial link to, uh, to Arduino. Um, so I would suggest those are two good starting places and then um, a heavy use of, of Google to find whatever is the latest and greatest. Super. Uh, let's see, another question here from Angel. What is the range of obstacle detection? Uh, that depends on the sensor. The particular sensor that uh, is used in the robot kits is about two meters. Um, uh, there are cheap versions of ultrasonic sensors. Uh, um, the, the one that, uh, um, that's in the kit is a, a very high quality parallax sensor. Uh, you can find very cheap ultrasonic sensors on on the web that are a fraction of the price, but they're a fraction of the quality. So the range of the the eBay ones is probably about half of that. Um, the uh, infrared sensors uh, vary uh, from um, probably a couple of meters down to uh, uh, to a meter or so. Uh, so generally, I would say two meters is probably uh, uh, the maximum. It is possible to get specialist sensors as well, which are more focused, much much narrower beam, uh, and go a little bit further. But I would say a good sensor uh, typically allow uh, six feet or so. Great. Question here from Jeffrey. How many digital inputs can be multiplexed to expand the use of PWM signals? For example, to control solenoids with UNO and MEGA. Uh, with UNO and MEGA. Uh, right. How many, uh, uh, if the question is specifically about PWM, um, it, it, the, well, it, whether it's PWM or, or digital, it's kind of a, almost unlimited, uh, but, you, but it's tough. Um, so how many you can do depends on how, uh, sophisticated you want to build your application. For example, um, uh, at Maker Faire, I saw um, an interesting uh, hexapod, a, uh, a six-legged robot. You actually saw a picture of it in uh, the beginning of the uh, of my presentation, which has 19 servos. It has 18 servos for the leg and one for the, uh, for the sensor. Um, and um, uh, the Arduino chip, which is controlling, uh, it's using the same chip as the, the Leonardo chip, um, is controlling those 32 sensors and a bunch of other stuff as well. And it's doing it by multiplexing. And the particular technique that's used there is by using shift registers to uh, control the, um, uh, the position of the pulses. And the shift registers are controlled using a serial protocol. For those of you familiar with Arduino will know about SPI. Uh, it's one of the uh, protocols that uh, Arduino supports, and there are a number of peripherals that use it. Um, but it's a certain kind of serial protocol. And uh, that's used to control the chip. And um, uh, with that technique, you can control an awful lot of things. Uh, but um, it's complicated code. So the, I guess the short answer is there's a lot of expandability capability. Again, I would suggest looking at the playground um, for, for different techniques. Some are dedicated chips. The particular shift registers that I was referring to are actually just very, very simple uh, shift registers. There are a lot of ways of doing it. Uh, a search in the playground is probably a good next step. Thank you so much. Um, question here from Alberto. What kind of false positives might pulse in receive in a robotic application, um, like reflection, et cetera? Yeah, lots and lots, um, which is one of the reasons why 
uh, the Pulsin code should um, uh, include, Pulsin has the ability to say what the maximum amount of time you want to wait for. And if you're pulsating, as an example that I showed, uh, using Pulsin to measure the distance of a ping sensor, you would want to set that to be just a little bit more than, um, than the time of the uh, uh, the maximum uh, distance, the maximum amount of, of pulse time. Uh, that's preventing the case where it's not receiving uh, where it's not receiving anything uh, anything at all. You'll get a return back uh, uh, more quickly. Um, but it can be triggered by uh, by various things. A lot of it, uh, a lot of the accuracy depends on the uh, the position, the height of the of the sensor. Uh, you get false positives if you use uh, infrared sensors can be uh, uh, can be very sen uh, can be sensitive to uh, um, strong infrared light. So um, uh, I'm not sure whether I can specifically say what the false positives are. What I can say is that uh, a good part of the challenge and the fun of building a robot is uh, being open to uh, recognizing them and finding ways uh, of dealing with them which might involve either uh, uh, physical location, which is a good first step, or in, in some extreme cases, physical, physical filtering. Uh, taking an average of values uh, is a very good way, and uh, I would certainly highly recommend that for any distance sensing application, that uh, uh, multiple readings, at least four readings, and I think in the uh, in the download code I've used eight, um, uh, are averaged so that you can get rid of some of the bad data. Perfect. Just a couple more questions here, and folks, time is winding down, so if we don't get to your question, we apologize in advance, but we do thank you for attending the event. And we again, check, check out your group chat. Please do open that if you haven't opened it. Lots of good discount codes in there to save you some money today. Michael talked about some fascinating things you can do with Arduino and making your robot. So check out the kits, the robot kits, Michael's books. They are all on special today to save you money using code ROBOT10. Okay, Michael, next question here from Earl. Earl asks, are you familiar with TI's BeagleBone? How does it compare to Arduino? Has Arduino um, been ported to work for BeagleBone? Uh, yes and no. Um, uh, yes, I'm familiar with it. Um, uh, has Arduino been ported to BeagleBone? No. Um, what, and then the middle question, which is, the, I guess, the key, is uh, how does it compare? BeagleBone is a, uh, a small uh, Linux computer and is ideal for uh, heavy processing of things like uh, uh, sound processing and visual processing um, because it has a lot more computing power and networking capability than, um, than, than our, the, the base, uh, the standard Arduino. Uh, Arduino's strengths are uh, uh, handling real-time capabilities and also price. The BeagleBone is many times, many times more expensive than uh, uh, the Arduino. Um, so um, uh, I would say that for um, uh, robotics, where there are a lot of sensors and uh, the, of the kind of sensors that I've been talking about, uh, sensors that are uh, responding to the physical world, uh, that's the strength of Arduino. If, however, you're doing visual processing, if, for example, you want to use a camera and process the information from the camera to determine where things are, then something like a, a bigger bone would probably be a better choice. Perfect. Question here from Alberto. Any guidance for those of us who are designing n leg robots? I'm asking about resources to learn algorithms to control the coordinated movement and ease of functions necessary for making them walk gracefully. <laughs> oh, there's a, there, that's a real challenge. Uh, a suggestion that I have is there is an open source project which is just getting off the ground, which includes a, um, a simulator for, specifically, a, it's a hexapod, but you could adapt it for, um, if you're, um, uh, you want to do something else, you can probably adapt it. It's pretty advanced. It's not, um, it's not 
there's not a lot of detailed documentation. Um, but uh, the guy who designed it is uh, is very clever, and uh, it's open source. And as I said, there's a simulator and a some Python code to control it. So if that's your bag, uh, I would look at uh, something called Hexy, H-E-X-Y, and the company is Arcbotics, A-R-C-B-O-T-I-C-S. Uh, so if you look for Arcbotics Hexy, you should see. Um, you should get to their page and then navigate to the GitHub open source information. It's, um, uh, it's not for beginners, but um, it's cool stuff. And a question here from Matt. Do you need any extra hardware to use the IR remote sensor, or does the sensor just plug in directly? In the shield that I chose, the sensor plugs in directly. Um, uh, basically, the sensor has three pins. Uh, one is the power, the, uh, the plus five volt pin, uh, and a ground, and then the signal pin. And uh, it, as long as you connect that sensor to those um, uh, to those pins on Arduino, the uh, plus five volts, ground, and to whatever pin you want to connect it to, it will work. But what I liked about the Adafruit Shield is that it has that row of six um, of six sets of pins, which all include power and ground. And so you can plug the sensor uh, uh, directly into it. Great. And our final question we'll take is from, let me take a look here, it's from Marcio. Marcio asks, um, are there some shields that allow us to use some kind of rechargeable batteries, like cell ones? Like what? Sorry? Like? Cell ones. Oh, we did oh, like, cell, like the cell phone batteries, like li yeah. the lithium batteries and cell phones. The answer is yes. Um, I'm seeing more and more of those. Um, one of the companies that um, uh, that sell them is Seed Studio, S-E-E-E-D Studio. Uh, they have boards that have built-in rechargers, and they I think they have modules. And I think there are some other companies as, as well. Uh, I'm not sure whether they're on Makershed. Um, uh, if you do a search for Google search for uh, lithium or LiPo, L-I-P-O, uh, uh, recharger and Arduino, uh, that's probably the search that will get the most hits uh, that are relevant, maybe add uh, circuit board or breakout board. Um, or, or whatever. Just a, a word of advice. The, most of these uh, uh, commercial devices are built using the same kinds of chips that are um, that are built into cell phones. Um, lithium batteries, if they're not charged correctly, can be dangerous. So um, I would recommend using a commercial product from a reputable company rather than trying to uh, to build your own, unless you really know what you're doing. Great. That does look like all the time we have for questions today, folks. Michael, as we wrap up, is there anything additionally you'd like to leave the audience with today? Um, that I hope that if you uh, were not sure that you wanted to uh, uh, do something with robots, that this talk has helped in some small way to encourage you to, um, uh, to, to uh, get involved uh, with with robots because it really is a great way to take Arduino to the next level. There are just so many different things that you can do with it. It's a, I've had a tremendous amount of fun with um, the robots that I've built, and I hope that you will too. Fabulous. Michael, thank you so much for a really fascinating webcast and a fun one today on Arduino and making robots. And judging by all the comments and chatter in our group chat, our audience really enjoyed the event. And many of them, are they say they're getting ready to build their robots or modify their robots. So we thank you, Michael, for presenting the webcast. Folks that attended, we thank you for attending and hope you've benefited from it. We'd like to let you all know again that Michael's book, and the robot kits are available today for you all from Make. Make is offering you a special discount. Use code ROBOT10 to save. Visit Makershed.com for details. We've also pushed out lots of good information to you all in the group chat. There's resources Michael mentioned. You can download some of the, the sample code files. So all of that is in your group chat. If you haven't
haven't opened it yet, please do. Lots of good details there. And finally, we'd like to leave you with O'Reilly Media is featuring Michael's book, The Arduino Cookbook, second edition, as the O'Reilly Deal of the Day. And that means you can get it at O'Reilly as well for a great discount. Visit O'Reilly.com. Look on the right-hand side. You can't miss it. It's right there. Again, we thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everyone.